Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is part two of the Arnold Classic 2024 at the NEC series. Hope you enjoyed the first one with a couple of interviews there and the Classic Physique pre-judging. We'll have the finals tonight, but uh, as it's all over the internet, I'm not going to put so much stage footage on. I'm just going to capture the experience here this weekend, and this is day two, starting with a little workout. Well, the hotel gym, and there's going to be time for a quick workout before breakfast so that I can include some working out over these three days. I just can't really do without it. But as I didn't get a chance to train arms at the end of the last back session, with the batteries going and other work to do, I'm going to see how I'm getting on with the biceps. So it's going to be nothing to failure, but just a light pump, bit of light exercise, test out the arms with nothing to failure on some curls. Maybe exercise four arms the first time, and then a huge breakfast and get to part two of this this series on the Arnold Classic up here in Birmingham. So there we are, set one, I've stopped, stopped well short of failure on just the 16 side. It's just getting a feel for how it is, there's a slight bruise came up when I did. When I did that injury a couple of weeks ago, so it's just been careful and seeing what I've got for the moment. And next I want to see what I'm able to do with chin-ups, because that's going to be a little bit more weight than that, give me a feel for uh, whether I'm actually injured with it, or it needs more, more of a rest or what. It's okay. <laughs> Not bad for nearly 300 pounds, I guess. Try just one more on that. Obviously, I think I could have got a little bit more with the wrist straps, but then Greenway's been uh, expecting to be training all this here. But I've never seen a I've never seen a hotel gym so busy at uh, 6 a.m. That's with the uh, Arnold Classic going on. <sighs> I'll revert back, revert back to trying the curls here. I want to get like three biceps exercises done, but it's very busy and a bit tight in here, and I don't want to get in anyone's way. So I'm going to switch over to triceps one and then come back to biceps. I wanted to do something maybe similar to preacher curls with one of these incline benches here, but triceps for now, I can do push downs.
gradual adjustable pulley here. I'd actually say that if you're making a home gym, one of the most versatile pieces of kit that you could possibly get would be a dual adjustable pulley kind of set up. This can do pretty much everything for arms on it, loads from chest, back. You can modify doing pull downs, and sit at the bottom and do a row if you've got a heavy enough stack. You can really do, do most of upper body on it in some fashion. I can put a little bit, a little bit more weight on here for another set of push down so I'm waiting to get back to testing out these these dodgy biceps. Last one on here then. show you this one now this is a handy little one to do if you're limited on equipment and want to try something a bit like a preach curl you can just take an inclined branch and uh, put it a little bit a little bit higher than your usual 45 degree and do one arm at a time with a dumbbell chop the elbow in front if you like this so give that a go um, this is the dodgy one by the way so be careful seeing how I'm how I'm getting on with it and doing doing something with it while it waits but it's promising I had no problems and, and trying those uh, those chin ups at my weight was a little bit risky on it and went fine so I'm sure all will be fine in the coming weeks. Another pair of sets on there. Now, honestly, this was just to do something 
and see how the arms are getting on. <laughs> it's not to pump up my arms for the expo, although that's a little side benefit, I guess. All I can think about now is breakfast. I've got about 10 minutes to go, but I want to be in there early and get absolutely loads. But I just feel like really strange coming back to normality and what a normal gym would be like, because I'm used to places like Zone or Body Works or like paintings of Kevin Leroney or Ronnie Coleman on the wall and stuff like this. And I was just looking at the decor in here and just reminding myself what normal, healthy human beings look like. It's, it's, actually, it's actually quite refreshing, but still quite a surprise for me after I'm what I used to on all these gym tours. It's now getting exceptionally busy in here and I don't want to get in anyone's way with the camera. So that was enough to know what's going on with the arms. I'm happy that they're going to be fine if I just gradually increase on them and don't do anything crazy on them and maybe try the heavier back workouts again first. Should be absolutely fine. But now I'm going to go and get ready for breakfast and resume discussing the Arnold Classic with you over there. And this is the proper way to start things off for today. But this is only part one. I have seen lots of croissants to finish up on as well, and then I'll be all set for the day. All right, guys, now I'm here with Dave Crossland of Eval, and uh, it's a pleasure to meet you, Dave. I was um, wondering if you could explain to some of my audience who are interested in the PED and enhancement side of physique development what the significance and the use of blood tests are with the work you're doing with Eval. So, the bottom line is, Anabolic use is not safe. There are risks. You can minimise and you can manage those risks, but you need to be aware of what one, what those risks are, and two, how those risks are affecting you. You can't guess that. You know, if you want to see how a drug's affecting certain markers, particularly stuff like lipids, where you won't feel anything, then the only way you're going to get that information is by blood testing. So all anabolic use will lower HDL. All anabolic use will increase red blood cell and haemoglobin content. So your blood can thicken, increase in blood pressure, more pressure on the heart. Your cholesterol patterns can change where you are cholesterol negative in the sense that you have higher LDL than HDL, which basically means you've got greater levels of circulating cholesterol. That increases the risk of plaque development and further down the line than something like a myocardial infarction, heart attack in common nerves. Um, so if you're aware of the risk, you can monitor and then you can adjust your lifestyle, be it different supplementation or potentially a little bit longer off or a change of compound choices because you're not in a position where your body can cope with those toxins at that point. So it's not that you don't use your anabolics, it's just that you use your anabolics smarter and you use them more in line with what your body's doing and what it can cope with. That's brilliant. So it's very much kind of risk mitigation yeah. and keeping, risk, risk keep it, yeah, yeah, keeping an eye on on this kind of, the kind of chronic problems that can develop that you wouldn't otherwise notice. What what do you think about the idea of using different strategies for keeping an eye on risks, such as using um, blood tests in in conjunction with having an echocardiogram every so often? Other other kind of risk, you know. Other so, ways of having eyes on it, as well as blood tests? Yeah, I mean, blood tests have their limitations. So for internal organ management in a way of like liver and kidneys, blood tests are great. Blood tests don't show a great deal in regards to heart health. They will show certain heart health risk factors, but not the actual condition of the heart itself. So in order to look at your heart itself, you're going to be looking at an ECG as a primary and an echocardiogram with would be your your best and I would suggest annually or, or a push 18 months because that's going to give you an indication of your injection and your heart health and your wall fitness and how your valves are functioning and everything that your heart's actually doing which you'll get none of that information from bloods but what you will get is the risk factors that can create problems in those areas but it's no way if for heart bloods aren't particularly good at giving you an indication of where you are uh, an echo is excellent. I mean, it, it's a scan of your heart, it shows you what your heart's doing and how it's operating. Uh, that's really, really useful information. They're not, they are expensive in a sense, but they're not when you factor it into the big picture. Uh, echoes are ranging between 150 and 250 pounds for an echo, depending on where you go. Which seems a lot, but if I told you it was going to cost you 250 pounds to MIT your car, 
you'd moan, but you'd do it. Well, this is it. You're yeah, talking yeah. about this annually yeah, yeah, yeah. or every 18 months or so. So uh, another question along the same lines. If you were to sort of suggest to someone what would be a kind of a kind of package of things to do, so say blood tests, an echo, maybe getting your own blood pressure monitor, whatever. If you were to yeah, suggest a, a handful of things as a, as a, as I a would process say to someone. Echo annual, depending on your level of use, but echo annually or 18 months blood test periodically, at least one big package annually, possibly every six months with then areas of concern managed from that point forward. Blood pressure is a really cheap way to just have a look at basic health. So that's a small investment, something you can do at home and something you can do as regular and as often as you want. I mean, the biggest single mitigating factor to health issues around antibiotic use is actually doing proper hard cardio, but it's the thing that nobody wants to do because everyone's scared you're going to lose muscle mass with it. You won't. <laughs> but it will make you a lot fitter and a lot healthier. Uh, people just people just don't get a pump from it, so it's no fun, right? Yeah, I, no, I'm a prime example. I hate cardio. I've always hated cardio. I thought it was a naughty word. Um, never ended my mind at all when I was big and bulking and pushing everything. And, and it's not the only factor that's contributed to the problems I have now, but it definitely played a role and would have mitigated some of the issues that I, I now deal with past my abuse but I mean that was my choice I went into it very open eyed uh, no regrets I would do the same again if I did it again might do a bit more cardio but other than that <laughs> yeah so remember cardio guys now we don't we don't give advice on this channel around uh, PEDs but it's all information that we find interesting theoretically and uh, on, the, on that kind of theme what, what would you say is, is something that would be safer in the grand scheme of things to be using year round theoretically there isn't, there isn't. Absolutely. Uh, the, uh, this annoys on, me about, on a continuum. Yeah, this annoys me about the industry at the moment. There's a lot of sports TRT, primo safety use, test and primo year round. Am I allowed to swear? Yeah, go for it. It's all fucking bollocks. Yeah. Um, so, primo is a mild drug when it comes to physical impact, but it destroys your HDL more than any other compound in the arsenal. There is no safe drug. Well, the other question is, if you uh, if you were shopping with the UGL, is it Primo? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, generally, actually, because of the demand for it, it's generally quite good these days. Go back five years, it was all garbage. But there's, there's no safe drug. You go anything above what your body uses naturally. So as soon as you start pushing test levels above 20, 22 mmol, you will start running into adulteration of health factors. There's a scale there, obviously, you know, 200 mega test is nowhere near as impacting as 2 gram, obviously, that's simple facts, but running Primo year-round or running Master on year-round as a form of estrogen management with a slightly higher than what you need to test will result in long-term problems. But there's no avoiding of that. The, what's, the worst thing about it is that when people do that, they normalise it, and then that becomes, that's my TRT. No, it's not. That's a cycle. Very small one, but it's still a cycle, and it still needs that level of respect. TRT is one thing and one thing only. Testosterone that puts you in natural ranges. Yeah. That's TRT. Wow. The reason people are interested in this in the first place anything, is because they want to go far beyond. Yeah, so any, thing. You can do what you want. Yeah. I mean, you're talking to a blood that took five gram. Yeah. 120 IU of insulin, 27 IU of growth a day. I was 415 pounds, I've got a wrecked heart, I've got wrecked kidneys. I, I don't, it's not a case of don't do this or don't do that, it's a case of be real about what it is. Yeah. That isn't TRT, and the problem is when people talk about it as being TRT, people then think, oh, someone who doesn't know much is like, all right, well this is what TRT should be. It's like, no, you're on a mini cycle. So a hit here side. You know? Yeah, that comes with risks that you're not even looking at because you think you're on a testosterone replacement dosing. So, beyond TRT, even with TRT patients, medically, they monitor their blood thickness every three months, or they should do. Yeah, yeah. they monitor their lipids because they know their areas of effect just by using actual prescribed TRT dosings. So, there isn't a year-round drug, but exposure to higher doses for control periods with monitoring of health going in and coming out, or even during if you need to manage your, your hormone effects, you can reduce those risks quite significantly. Safe's not a word you can use, but safer could safer, be a word you yeah, can yeah, use. Yes, yes. 
On the, um, the estrogen management side of things, is that kind of came up as you mentioned, like Primo and Masteron in, in smaller doses in a, an ongoing um, testosterone program. Um, what are your thoughts on aromatase inhibitors versus uh, things like things like Masteron, or do you think it's sort of dose dependent compared to your, your drugs like the like, um, Dianabol and uh, testosterone and uh, estrogen conversion and the, the, the doses of those? Let's say your point or your aim in your cycle is to do a total androgen dose of 500 milligrams a week. And you pick 500 milligrams of test and then decide you're going to run three, 400 milligrams of Master Primo to control estrogen. You're now at a total androgen dose of eight to 900. That, in my head, no. If you so were intending on running eight to 900 in the first place, then yes, that's a sensible split of your drugs. So you're thinking more exomestane in, in this? In if, so if I have, necessary, yeah, I have, after looking at the, the blood markers, I guess. Primo and Masteron are very useful drugs in that you get an androgen that has an estrogen management effect. If that's in your, and the thing is your cycle should be designed about you as a person, as in your body composition and stuff like that, your goal, what you're trying to achieve, and your health. Steroids are tools, and you pick the right tool for the right job. I can hammer a nail into a wall with a big heavy spanner, but it's not the right tool for the job. So if I want to grow, I'm not looking at Primo, I'm looking at the old wet drugs like Test and Decca because they're the big mass builders. If I'm cutting for a show or I'm having a tidy up, I'm not looking at Decca because the management side of that's much more complex. So then I'm looking at Mast and Primo because they're easy to manage to keep estrogen in place. But I would never add an androgen to control estrogen on top of what I was planning on doing. But I would use it in part of the plan of the total androgen load I was looking to use. So if I wanted to run 500 milligram a test, and that was what I wanted to do, then I would look at using an AI. If I wanted to run 900 milligram total anabolics, then I could look at 500 test, 400 master, or 400 primo. I'm still within what I was aiming to do totally, but I'm getting my estrogen management from my second compound. So it's, it's, there's no issue with using those drugs to control estrogen, as long as they're in the total plan. When it starts to get a bit, dodges when you're adding them on top, increasing the anabolics you're using beyond what you were thinking of doing and beyond what's necessary, just for the sake of controlling estrogen, just use aromacin. It's HDL protective, yeah. you know, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's generally quite a nice drug to use in that sense for what it does. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think if someone's got real, you know, real problems and need fixing urgently, a little bit stronger things like Electrosol, perhaps, but... Um, Electrosol is rare, but ADEX would be the, the, the sort of... Electrosol is a real sledgehammer of a drug. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 96% efficient. It, it really is, you know, you, you will get rid of your estrogen, but you will get rid of it completely. <laughs> okay. I'm going to make this the last question, Dave, because you've been very generous with your time. No problem. If um, one, of my, one of my audience here wanted to do their own research, as it were, what kind of articles or books, to, publications right, might to be, you recommend? To be honest, to start with, I would definitely recommend reading uh, James Llewellyn's Anabolics. Yeah. It's, it's not the Holy Bible. Yeah, I actually reviewed it on this channel, 2006 edition, before they started removing stuff though. But it, it's, uh, it, it gives you a good overall understanding yeah. of how the drugs work in your body, how your body responds. Either, most people misunderstand what PCT, uh, what the drugs are actually for. Yeah. And uh, Llewellyn does a good job of describing what those drugs actually do and yes. why they're used. And then there's a big catalogue of drugs at the back of the book. Uh, that can be a bit misleading. It's not that the information's wrong, it's just that it doesn't put in context. Overview, starting point. Sort yeah. Of, yeah. But the, the first portion of the book, which just explains health and anabolics and how it all works, is actually quite a good grounding. Yeah. So I'd recommend that as a start point. From there, he the, the, starts to get them very opinionated as to who you read and who you're Dante or, I mean, if you want the extreme end of stuff, Paul Morrison's material. It wasn't incorrect, but it was extreme end of usage. I mean, Paul pioneered some stuff that is commonplace now, but when he started doing it, everyone thought he was bonkers. He was bonkers, but he was a nice bonkers. <laughs> Or if you want to go really old school, down and dirty, I suppose there's Dan the Shave. Yeah, there is, and Dan, there's a lot of stuff that Dan put out that's very good. There's one or two bits that now he's thought of as being probably incorrect or, or not quite. But the thing is, the world's changing all the time. 
yeah. you know, anabolic research is generally not governed around recreational use, it's governed around medical research. Yeah, I mean, when I when I when people ask me about this this sort of thing, the starting point I recommend is the um, is a, what is it? I think it's a new New England Journal of Medicine um, research into testosterone doses and it sort of does pretty, you know, 100 milligram increments a week up to about 600. Goes up to 600. And, uh, and that's that's a good starting point for research, I would suggest. But the thing is, that's all, as you say, not in a recreational sporting context. It's remedial only, so they don't need to. They're, they don't need to test beyond 600 milligrams a week, do they? So. Well, they won't. They won't even do that now. No, they won't pass no. ethics, but. There is a move to start communicating between, I'm on quite a few committees, like academic committees. Uh, I'm the chairman of the Public Expert Advisory Board, which is sidelined with ASUK, which covers all anabolic research in the UK. And we're having a lot of conversations now about trying to move towards effective research that actually reflects what the community needs. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the early stuff is going to be very baby step because of the ethics question and because of getting things passed by ethics board. But there's still bits and bats that we really could do with clarity on. A simple one, for example, that people probably don't realise is the time lag between testosterone peaks and oestrogen peaks it can be as long as two weeks. So you'll get people where the test is just in range, but they're eating sky high and they start panicking, banging a load of anti estrogens in, smashing the oestrogen through the floor when in fact it was only three days of coming down anyway. But we, we need to know what's that time delay, what, what window are we looking at that it takes that conversion so we can relate well actually that level is related to that level of test a week before or two weeks before or whatever it is and then we can sort of be more effective about right you don't need an AI at this point you just need to wait three four days it'll be down. Anecdotally I hear that people have less problems with um, estrogenic side effects and conversion if they basically pin less but more frequently what do you think about that? To an extent so I'm going to use your chest to draw on now Go for it. So, when you inject, yeah. <laughs> if this line on your chest is, say, our upper natural limit, obviously when we inject, very often we go above this. So it's, let's just use a TRT scenario to start with. So we, we decide we're going to do a single dose once a week. So we've got a high peak here, which is above this natural limit, and then by the end of the week it's underneath it. Right. And obviously we want to be, we don't want to be down here on the arse at the end of the week. So we end up having to be high here. When we go over here, things like estrogen conversion accelerates, it increases. So by doing frequent, you get lower peaks more often. Yeah. You don't cross that threshold, yeah. you don't accelerate estrogen yeah. conversion. Very effective in a TRT scenario, gets less effective in a cycle, but there's still some to a degree. Yeah, and then you're, you know, there's different types of risk. Obviously, if you're penetrating your skin like more times, that's more risk. Yeah, there's, 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 there's obviously that. things like that as well. I mean, generally, injection, we don't see a ton of abscesses. They still do occur, but it, it's not, it's not common, guys. I'll leave it at that, Dave. You've okay. been very generous with your time. Pleasure, and, uh, pleasure, pleasure to meet you. I'm sure, I'm sure we'll uh, we'll stay in contact after after this. And, no problem. We'll enjoy the and, rest uh, of the show. I found Andrew Jack. Yes, no, you're enormous in real life. No, I'm not. You see, you see your big on the camera. I don't know. Do you want to pose down? <laughs> Back like a spread? No. I'm sore as fuck. And it's morning. I'm so stiff. I haven't done like some walk around to loosen up. <laughs> you still training this weekend while you're while you're here? No. No, no, no. No, no I'll come this busy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll definitely. I'll have to attempt. And what does training look like year round for you? Do you, do you take a number of weeks or months off? Uh, like training now? At all? Like now? No, it's pretty easy. Like now, I just, I just cruise. You know, I'm not, I'm not on a program. And it's all, it's less stress and less like uh, work. So I'm just like mentally just relax and all that. How much, how much time do you spend um, away? I know you, you don't you train in Binus and Dubai quite a lot. You spend most of your time there or where are you? Where are you I live, I live in Dubai. You live there, yeah, right? I, live there. I spend most of my time doing the UA, so yeah. Like work at home. Yeah, cool. Nice one, thank you. Just found a nice spot in the hotel to get a bit of work done and round out this second edition, second volume of the series here. And I'm just reflecting on who I've met so far and what happened last night, which I haven't recounted yet. I was particularly impressed yesterday with, with Logan Franklin. We had a good chat 
after the recorded segment. And just everything, everything about his approach to things is, was very clean and professional and do it properly. And I, I think I didn't realise just how serious he is. You know, I think I think maybe because he'd come through like kind of fitness modelling and men's physique, I wasn't I wasn't sort of you know to be totally honest, putting him in the same kind of category as you know the Chris Bumstairs Ramon. And this, but I'd always thought his physique was amazing. But just talk, just talking to him, we seeing eye to eye on all sorts of things about food quality and real food, and uh, you know, he's he's been a lot more a lot more sensible than me, you could say, in in how he's kind of done things slowly, done things the right way. And as I said in that video yesterday, if I had my time again, I would have done things slowly but progressively, and and more more in the fashion that he described and for him to be in that kind of condition in off season was really impressive. When I watched the video back as I was editing it, I can see as he as he flexes triceps you can see all the striations in in all of it, which that's that's kind of like a four weeks out here. You know, he's talking about being eating the way that he'd be eating eight weeks out as an off season thing. But that kind of condition is more typical of four weeks out, even at a very high level. So for him to maintain that kind of muscle quality year round, you know, it'd be in striking distance of competing within two or three weeks at any point in that kind of in that kind of condition, if not if not less, if he's really pushing things and I'm talking about maintaining a marketable look by doing that, but I just think he's maintaining a better look as much as anything. I'm not even close to that kind of condition how I am now, so that, that was it was a really interesting chat and a really nice guy, but a lot of other conversations took place throughout yesterday, particularly last night, because it turns out pretty much everyone's staying at the same hotel as me. I'm staying at the Hilton, which is a stone's throw from the venue, really. And in this bar, where I'm sat now, last night basically the, the who's who of international bodybuilding was here we had um we had hanny rambod was uh, was over there with the Everton lot and uh fuad abiyad was was here ian valier was with him um i met ronnie coleman in here last night and actually that was that was something i was gonna i was gonna show this is what i was uh, very keen to uh to do this weekend, just get the, the book hardcore signed. So I got the book hardcore signed, and just made me reflect some more about about Ronnie, like the kind of state that he's in now. He's, he's if you didn't know, he's in uh, an electric wheelchair at the moment, and I think he's kind of really sacrificed everything about his body to be the greatest at something. And I don't think we'll ever see that kind of development quality and strength, again, he's given all that to it, but what impresses me more, or just as much as that, is just this relentless positivity in whatever circumstances throughout his whole career and even extending to now, you know, he's, he's just a lovely guy, he doesn't seem bitter about any of it, has no regrets, just totally positive, and, and that's how he was early on in his career when he talk about placing very low when for a number of years when he got to the Olympia level and just carrying on because he enjoyed it and and just kept going and doing more contests and never complained about anything and just carried on because he loves it and obviously loves what he, what he does and relentlessly positive and I think whether you like bodybuilding or not that's got to be an example for us all in whatever we do and, and so he inspires me in that sense as well as as well as me having a particular interest in bodybuilding so I'm very grateful that that he was happy to sign my book while I was while I was down when I, when I collected it from my room I was down here at the bar because um, I don't want to intrude. You see, that, that's why there's no videos from last night because I sort of feel like when we're all when we're all at the expo mingling and doing meet and greets and and you know just chatting to strangers in the hall, you know we're all kind of work mode and accept that there's going to be pictures and filming and questions and stuff like that. But I just sort of feel that late night at the hotel bar and some people having drinks with their friends they've come with or you know even the Everton lot were having their meal but 
it'd be inappropriate to be getting the camera out and asking questions and pushing that kind of thing. So that's, that's why there's no footage of all of that. That's why I just thought I'd talk about it to document my weekend because in the same way that I don't want to disturb people's training when I'm in a gym or, or interrupt people when they're training, I take that same approach to doing a weekend like this, you know, so in the gym I try not to get in people's way with my filming and if I need to speak to someone in the gym I'll either message them afterwards or speak to them at the reception and not disturb their workout and with with an event like this I feel like it's okay to like pose for pictures and <laughs> almost accost people like for a little video if they're happy with that when we're in the expo hall but when it's kind of relaxed in the evening in the hotel even if you're having a chat and that's all good, it's not, it's not one to be getting the camera out. So that, that, there's, no, there's no footage, but I can say that everyone, uh, all, of, all those folks I just mentioned that I spoke to last night has really added to the experience for me. So I'm very grateful for all of that. And um, well, speaking to Fuad, I made mention of really enjoying <laughs> the bro chats and the podcasts uh, with the with the hostile lot and and how that was particularly amazing like during 2020 when we were in the in the lockdowns and wanted entertainment all the time that that was provided and um had had a good chat with them asked them how samson's getting on and just just having an amazing time that's that was that was last night that was who was who was <laughs> down down in this very room last night and I really didn't expect that for the weekend. I just booked a hotel that was nearby, what was available last minute, and it turns out kind of everyone's here apparently. So all that added to uh, all added to the experience. Um, I'll be, you know, if if possible and appropriate, I'll be taking more few quick interviews. As, as part of my time at the Expo, this edition, as, as you've just seen, I got to speak to Dave Crossland at length and really grateful for his time there, have a bit of a laugh and meet Andrew Jacks, who does look amazing in person, he's incredibly broad, I think you can't really see like in the video just how, just how well put together he is like for, for bodybuilding, but obviously you can see that on stage, I think he still has the potential to go quite significantly further so I'll keep an eye on Andrew Jack for certain you know as well as well as Samson but I don't know who else is I saw a few other people like in the in the hall today Ryan Terry the men's physique Mr Olympia after all this time was down there I have, I've actually met him twice before Ryan Terry and he I can say he's uh, he's a great guy I'm just making sure while I'm while I'm here that I'm staying on top of check-ins. That's why I've got my laptop. So I'm doing a, doing a bit of work, helping helping a few people today with their ongoing progress and refining their plans week by week. So I I still take delight in doing that because I'm like I'm like bored of this body. You know, I've been doing this for 20 years. So it's kind of like if you were into another hobby, like you know riding motorbikes or playing guitar. If you had the same motorbike or the same guitar for 20 years, you'd just be kind of like, eh, eh, you know, whereas like, well, I mean, I still love it. It's still well-being and progress. I, you know, I love muscle and gym and training, and everything. Don't get me wrong, but I'm working with the same, I'm working with the same hardware here, like for 20 years. So if I'm working with someone else, I get much more excited about it and be like, Oh, you know, it's got totally different strong points and different muscle insertions that are longer here and there that could be really good. And you know, this would be a bit like if you're into motorsport and you know took a new took a new bike out for a spin, like for for a few months after being stuck with the old one for 20 years. It's kind of like how it is. So I, I always I always love like helping someone else with this stuff, and I hope that where I'm not doing that on a one-to-one -one basis some of the content that I'm putting out is helpful for those who are studying enough to work this all out on their own so I'm always, always redirecting to the diet planning videos and I think there was a lot of information if, if you were to go through it slowly there was actually a lot of information given away in the interview with Dave today I think 
if you really pick through all of that and everything he's talking about that and made sure to follow up on all of those points if you're looking after yourself and doing all this kind of thing on your own you could get a lot of value from that so I'm extremely grateful for um, for Dave's time today and I think that's going to have to be the highlight of edition two I'm going to wrap it up now to make sure that it's published today edit it and get it out there I expect there will be an edition three because it's Saturday as I'm recording this piece here and I'm still here till tomorrow so who knows what will happen I have decided not to put the footage of last night's finals in because they're all over the internet anyway if you want to see what happened with the contest there is a lot of channels there's even if you want to watch it live the finals tonight there's a free live stream as well so I just think there's no need for me to be duplicating it the video from yesterday I did think was a good idea to put that video of classic physique prejudging in because I was in one of the very front rows I think I was only the third row back with all of the athletes coaches and everything like that so I had a really good spot for for filming it there and then so that's included but don't expect any contest footage for this series because I don't see the point other people have got cameras set up right near the judges desk for finals and it'll all go out on the internet and there's a live stream so you, you, you know it's all provided elsewhere if you're particularly on that I think uh, I focus on documenting my experience of the weekend and providing interviews where possible and, and that'll be it so one more edition of this I'm expecting get this one out now any questions drop them in the comments if you're enjoying my content on all matters bodybuilding make sure to subscribe and stay in touch with any of your requests and questions I look forward to speaking to you all soon cheers <laughs>